Hello, everyone, and welcome to the launch of the Haitian Art Society's first live streamed art talk entitled The Indigenous Styles of Haitian Art. My name is Ed Gessen, and I am the president of our group. I've been a member of the Haitian Art Society for over 18 years, and I'm an avid collector of Haitian art and especially Haitian voodoo flags. I'm totally captivated by these beaded and sequined banners as they are a unique art form exclusively produced in Haiti. My wife, Anne, and I currently live in St. Petersburg, Florida, having relocated a few years ago from Los Angeles. Since we elected to postpone our annual HASS conference in San Diego, originally scheduled for this month due to health concerns, we have chosen to create a new program to keep everyone involved, educated, and entertained. If you are not very familiar with the Haitian Art Society, we are a worldwide group of art enthusiasts, educators, museum professionals, scholars, gallerists, and collectors. We organize and hold an annual conference, publish a quarterly newsletter called Veve, and host a highly acclaimed website. This site features world-class public and private art collections and a wide variety of other Haitian art resources. This site is free to all, but we need your support. Please join our organization with your paid membership by going to our website to join at HaitianArtSociety.org. We also sponsor a Facebook page with over 5,800 members. Our webmaster, Mr. Matt Dunn, will give us a brief tour of the website at the conclusion of this program. The format of today's art talk will be to feature two subject matter experts in Haitian art, presenting discussions on both Hector Hippolyte and on the artists of Sans Soleil. The talks will be followed by a Q&A chat session with our esteemed presenters. Each presenter will, will speak for about 15 minutes, followed by a 20 minute Q&A session. Today's two panelists are Mr. Gerald Alexi, art historian, acclaimed author, scholar, and museum professional. He was born in Haiti and now resides in Quebec City, Canada. Gerald will be discussing the Haitian master, Hector Hippolyte. 
and Dr. Mark Taylor, English professor at Berry College in Rome, Georgia. Mark is a scholar and accomplished author. Mark will be presenting the story of the Sans Soleil School of Art, and Mark resides in Atlanta, Georgia. This production was created and produced by the Haitian Art Society, led by Vice President Magdala Racine Silva, in collaboration with the Fritz Racine Foundation. We sincerely, we sincerely hope you will enjoy it and welcome your feedback and ideas for future programs. So now I will turn the program over to Gerald. Something is going to change in my life. And uh, but when he bought went to Peter's, he said, Yes, I will show that a white man is going to visit Peter says no. Don't say a white man is going to change your life. You are going to change the culture of your country. My name is Gerald Alexis. As an art historian, of course, being born in Haiti, I am uh, naturally developing a strong interest for Haitian art. I have been collecting it, as a matter of fact, uh, focusing mainly on works on paper. Pierre Monosier, whom you have just seen uh, in the beginning of this sequence, introduced me to the work of Hector Hippolyte. And um, I have been fascinated since and I'm delighted to have the opportunity to show you and to discuss with you uh, some of my notes on um, a few of his paintings, three of them actually. However, it would be inappropriate to generalize because several of his portraits of Loise are individual expressions in which there are choices made at times far removed from the traditional Christian images. It is also a fact that although considered a voodoo artist, some of his works are influenced by his own observation of the world around him, and some are relating are related to movements, moments of his own life. This painting, <clears throat> sorry, this painting is titled Crucifixion because it's associated with the scene described in the Bible. By but Hippolyte himself had given it the title Adoration de la Mort, which is misspelled, of course, in the title here, and but means adoration of death. With that title, he surely was giving us a clue to understand the picture. If indeed there is a man on the cross, he expresses absolutely no suffering despite his bleeding hands and sides. Also, the figures at the bottom of the cross are obviously not the traditional representation of the Virgin Mary, Mary Madeleine, and John. We therefore can assume that the man on the cross may not be Christ. Dwelling, dwelling a moment on the idea of death suggested by the title, we find that voodooists have a whole set of beliefs and practices that surround it. In their vision of the earth and the universe, they have established a close relationship entangled in the dynamic between life and death. Death is so important that there is a whole family of Loise associated with it, the family Gede. Gede is the spirit of death. It is believed that if the soul of the dead enters the depth by a passage which Gede is a guardian, the life forces will emerge from the same depth in the same path. Maya Duran, the American filmmaker 
who studied voodoo and made a documentary called The Divine Horseman, The Living Gods of Haiti, expressed in her own words the same idea. The cosmic abyss, she said, is both womb and tomb. All of this surely sounds like the resurrection. In the voodooist perception of Kede, he is, like all Lois, both spirit and human. It therefore was fitting to have him represented by the image of Christ, who shares the same dual nature, was crucified, died, and was resurrected. But our considerations do not stop here. Because Gede reigns over the soul of the dead, he is a vector of communication and thus is consulted to get ancestral counsels. Therefore, we can suppose that the women at the foot of the cross are not people who are witnessing the crucifixion, but are devotees imploring Gede. Such scenes are so common are so common in Haiti that it is impossible to argue that Hippolyte probably did not, was not influenced by, by Catholic images, but for, from scenes that he has seen over and over and that others have painted, photographed, or drawn. Here we have one of Hippolyte's most famous paintings. It has a double title, Woman with Flowers and Birds, or Mistress Erzili. That's because it can be viewed as a secular image, a nude, or a sacred image, the image of a loi. Before we go any further, it is important to insist on the fact that Hippolyte was fascinated by women, particularly those of the Haitian elite. He often painted them in moments of leisure. Because of the social and economic context in which Hippolyte lived, one could assume that his paintings carried uh, some criticism, uh, some, kept some bitterness, a uh, hidden revolt, but this was not so, absolutely not. He painted these women because he appreciated their good taste, luxury of their clothes and their jewels, all characteristics of Ezeli, the beauty, the goddess of love, kindness, fortune, and health. Ezeli, the goddess of voodoo, is traditionally represented by the image of the Virgin Mary, a white woman who in the imagery of the Judeo-Christian culture is depicted wearing a blue cloak. The woman in Hippolyte's painting is black, is black and naked. So how can she be associated with Ezri Freda? Let us, if you want, consider some details of the painting. The female figure that we see here Stand before a screen made of flowers and birds, elements of nature. Light seems to come from the back of the painting. Uh, it, it's a way for him to put an emphasis on the figure on the for, in the foreground. She, with her left hand, she holds a branch, indicating that she is part of that same world, the, way, the world of natural goods. She, after all, she is human. At the same time, her placement in the foliage with the birds and flowers indicates that she shares the habitat of the Loire. The light coming from the back allows us to see that her feet stand in a void. Her body thus defies gravity. By elevating her in this fashion, Hippolyte gave her a sort of magical naturalism, the beauty of an ethereal idea. We have here an earlier image dealing with a similar topic that demonstrates the technical progress achieved by Hippolyte over a period of two years. But it also shows that he also associated the woman with the loi by placing her in the foliage of trees and by having her hold a sword, a symbol of power. You will note that the woman in the first version on the left is white. So how can this difference be explained? We know, for he has told the story a hundred times, that he fell in love in, with an African woman named Margaret Jackinson. He said that they lived together on an island of Karajin in Africa, a place that no one has ever been able to spot on the map. 
We also know that during his frequent visits to the Centre d'Art, he became familiar with the indigenous idea shared by poets, painters, and photographers of the time who paid tribute to the black race by praising the beauty of Haitian women. This could very well have reinforced Hippolyte's sense of beauty and thus the way in which he could represent as Rifreda. In no way do I want to imply that Hippolyte copied this photo of a nude. I just want to say that such an image may have easily been accessible to him. In this painting, Hippolyte shows men boarding, uh, loading a boat uh, with, of the Standard Fruit Company in the harbor of the city of Saint-Marc, which is northwest of Port-au-Prince. In the 1930s and the 1940s, uh, the Standard Fruit Company paid Haitians to produce bananas that were loaded on into refrigerated freight ships and sent to the United States. In the late 1940s, the Haitian government nationalized the industry, ending banana export. Before making a living from his art, Victoria Polit did odd jobs. When living in St. Mark, he may have been one of the men loading the banana on the boat. Since the painting was done in 1947, while he was living in Port-au-Prince, it is from memory that he describes the scene. This allowed him to define the structure of the work as he saw fit. He knows, he shows us, for instance, how he deals with the notion of space by superimposing the flat surfaces, the ship, the island, and the back. He shows only the essential, only the essential elements uh, of the narrative. Con this is contrary to most of his peers who fill their canvases with superfluous details. Here we have a great void around the boat, the boat being, of course, the main subject of the painting. Hippolyte gives it a particular, a particular attention and a great detailed uh, description. And the boat is the only element for which he wanted to create the impression of volume. In this painting, there is no discourse, neither religious, nor political, nor social. It is a transcription of a particular moment of his life. To understand why this image is so meaningful, it is important to know that Hippolyte was obsessed with a project, a project that he entrusted to his friends, Jean Chenet and Philippe Toby Maslin. He wanted to build a boat. David Peters had to advance the funds necessary for the construction, and La Sirene, the mermaid, was supposed to bring the engine one evening. He wanted to take all his friends on a voyage, but not very far at first. He just wanted to go to the city of Saint-Marc, where he lived for several years. He had planned the whole scenario. It would be a triumphant arrival in the city surrounded by his friends, the artists, the Hussis, his mistresses. He would wear a flamboyant admiral's costume and he would receive a standing ovation from everyone. It was a dream, a sort of challenge to the misery he had known in this part of the country for 25 years. He wanted the people of Saint-Marc and its surroundings to know that living in the capital city, his status had changed. The sad thing is that Hippolyte never made that trip. As a matter of fact, the unfinished boat was sold to cover some of the expenses of his funeral on of June 9th of 1948. The surrealist poet, André Breton, said, Hippolyte is in possession of a secret. The secret is now safeguarded in his paintings. But since we know that works of art carry and reveal a whole range of knowledge about a time, a people, about the world and about itself, by looking closely at the of, and often at the works of Victoria Polite, the secret that they hold well, could well be uncovered. Thank you. I would like to point out, however, that Hippolyte and Robert Saint-Brice are part of a distinct group of Asian popular artists that will later include the artists of the Saint-Solet community that was created in the mid-1970s 
and went on and on. We surely heard, you surely heard about the Saint Soleil. Well, you will know more about this movement in a while, listening to the ideas proposed by Dr. Marv Taylor. <laughs> À Soissons, l'art est comme une source d'eau qui jaillit et stimule les énergies dans un climat de confiance. Voilà ce que dit un paysan de Soissons, la montagne. Une section rurale à 18 km ou une demi-heure en voiture. Le pour les paysans, Saint-Soleil a été très reconnu. Impressionné par l'authenticité et la puissance de l'art qu'il vit à Soissons, la montagne, André Malraux fut fasciné par la présentation d'un musée vivant et une pièce de théâtre improvisée par les paysans. Hello, I'm Mark Taylor. I'm fascinated by the spirituality and history of Haitian art. And of course, my wife Melinda and I love seeing such beautiful paintings on our walls. I'm now going to bring you forward 30 years to the beginning of the Sans Soleil movement, what one critic declared the most unique experience in 20th century Haitian art. If Hector Ibolit is the greatest representative of the DeWitt Peters 1943 art renaissance in Haiti, then the founding of Sans Soleil 30 years later by Jean-Claude Garut, better known as Tiga, must represent Haiti's greatest art revolution. To say that Peters gave new birth to art in Haiti is to admit that art was already there before his arrival. And of course it was. To call Sans Soleil a revolution is to assert that its style could not have evolved from or been anticipated by the styles associated with the Centre d'Art. As Gérald Alexis has just shown us, we are still working to better understand Hector Hippolyte's art. While a number of books and articles have been written about Hippolyte, there is as yet no sustained critical study of Sans Soleil leading toward a comprehensive history about the movement and its art. This talk is a gesture in response to that gap. To be sure, Haitian art is suffused with Vodou worldview. Vodou beliefs are encoded or symbolized in the art, yet we cannot account for the individual modes of expression of Hector Hippolyte or André Pierre or Robert Sombris merely with an appeal to Vodou beliefs. Hippolyte's expression tends toward the surreal, representational, but not natural. André Pierre's is quite natural, whereas Saint-Brice's is expressionist, non-representational, non-naturalistic. So here's a question for you. Why did Saint-Soleil's style follow from Saint-Brice and not from the others? A fuller explanation must be found in something more than shared Vodou beliefs especially when we consider that such stylistic similarities can be found across cultures the world over. Let me give you one idea. To paint or draw a dream vision by nature ineffable dynamic is to translate a spiritual experience into a static form that our eyes can relate to. The language of the mystic is the language of metaphor saying one thing in terms of another. To translate, the painter must learn the symbolic forms and adopt a mode for depicting them. We understand how the symbolic nature of Haitian art comes from a shared Vodou worldview, and we recognize the same symbols across all these artists, but the depictions, they are too diverse. 
Andre Pierre wants to translate the Vodou world of spirits as naturalistically as possible. What in literary studies is usually called a literal translation. Sombris rejects that in favor of an idiomatic translation, one that wants to recreate in the viewer the experience of the vision itself. His abstract gestural strokes depict as directly as possible, not the loi, but the effect of spiritual energy that enveloped him within the vision of the loi. By adding a few physical features, Sombris lets the viewer know what it is a vision of, but the gestalt of viewing the painting brings us into the recreated experience. Even beyond his dreams, Sombris' natural world becomes suffused with spiritual energy. Dualism disappears. There is no supernature over nature. Spirit and matter are one, and it's moot to ask which gave birth to which. This is what I see going on in Sans Soleil art. Sans Soleil artists have chosen to translate the Vodou world in the mode of Sombris, not in the modes of other Vodou artists. The best Sans Soleil art crackles with energy. This is what is revolutionary. So back to, our, to the question. Despite the several different styles of depicting the Vodou world, why did all Sans Soleil artists choose to depict that world in the same experiential mode? What did all early Sans Soleil artists have in common? One thing was Tiga and his pedagogy. The artistic rotation method has often been mentioned in connection with Tiga. He had developed it in the 1960s and had fully incorporated it into the Potomitan school in 1968. In Soissons, it was, the pl in, it was in place from the beginning. And it was the foundational pedagogy by which the Sans Soleil artists discovered their creativity. Tiga believed that art is much more than painting. So besides ink and color, his artistic rotation includes other forms of expression. Music and dance, also sensual and wholly dynamic, are in the rotation. Clay, sensual and dynamic, bridges all expressions. Rhythm dominates. A student versed in the rhythm of music and dance becomes open to recreating rhythm in the static media of drawing and coloring. Sombris was already outstanding in the way rhythm organizes his composition and guides his brushstrokes. Superior rhythm in line and color is the hallmark of the best Sans Soleil paintings. Rhythm is the vehicle of its energy. Early Sans Soleil works have been described as calligraphic, which is an art form dominated by rhythm. Rhythm in Haitian life, music, dance, ritual, opens one to receiving the vision out of which the spiritual is manifested. One of the original members of Saint Soleil, Saint Jean Saint Just, put it this way, Tiga has a special word that has to be opened inside you to draw out whatever is in you. Whatever else Tiga's students understood in his pedagogy, what is important here is one's experience of art not imitation in art. Tiga was careful never to tell his students what to create. How then do account for the distinctiveness of style and similarity of subject in Sans Soleil painting? Tiga did, did let students watch him at work and what he produced owes much to Robert Sombris's abstract expressionism. Sombris died in 1973 at the start of the movement and therefore had little direct contact with the artists. But by the time they began exhibiting in Port-au-Prince and then abroad in 1974, they would have had the opportunity to see Sombris's works. And let's not forget, it was Sombris who found the name of the movement. Tiga recalled this anecdote. And now, if we are to address the origin of the phrase Sans Soleil, we can hardly forget our friend Robert Sombris, one of the great masters of the art of Haitian Vodou, who exclaimed in 1971 upon seeing one of our works shown at the home of Guy and Maude Robart, 
C'est son soleil. This was like a jolt of electricity to the heart. In a flash, we said among ourselves, that's the name. One can object that most Sans Soleil work does not obviously resemble Sans Gris. Sans Soleil is closer to expressionism and Sans Gris closer to abstraction. In fact, Sans Gris is the only non-modernist Haitian to have successfully ventured so far into abstraction. However, as Sans Gris developed his own technique, his style soon began to shift somewhat. He traded linearity for vigorous short strokes. Most Sans Soleil artists did not attempt to imitate Sans Brice's gestural brushstrokes. And no wonder, it is a difficult technique to master. Instead, they substitute stippling, lines, and decorative patterns. Payas is a notable exception. His paintings more obviously display the influence of Tiga's work, and he can handle the gestural strokes of Sans Brice. Like Sans Brice, Payas ventures further into abstraction than most other Sans Soleil artists. Although I am emphasizing stylistic modes here, I do not wish to ignore that a special symbolic glossary has become part of the language of Sans Soleil art. That examination, however, would require a separate study. As a single example, consider this motif where there appear to be emanations from the mouth of some of Saint Brice's Loire. It has been picked up by some Saint Soleil artists, notably Saint Jacques Smith in the 1970s, and more recently by Payas. There may be more going on here, but I recall being informed that Payas called them blessings. Finally, Despite the static, ahistorical way that Sans Soleil is usually presented to us in the literature, the artists, like all artists, develop their style and technique over time. That too would require a whole other study. Early works are difficult to identify and acquire, but the point is worth emphasizing. The earliest dated Sans Soleil paintings extant are from 1973, 1974, 1975. The earliest were not dated or signed at all. All I can do here is simply show you a handful of early examples of art by the Sans Soleil, the five, and a few from the next generation. These shown here are the products of the first wave, the original members, and the second wave who came in 1973. Among the second wave, Le Voix Exil is too well known to need comment, thanks to his inclusion in Malraux's L'Entemporel. Needless to say, his style has changed quite a bit since 1975. Uh, note that these uh, works are not signed and other artists will begin by writing only their initials. Some of course were illiterate. You cannot see much Sombris influence in this very early Louisiane saint Florent painting. The stippling and abstract pattern typical of her work will appear soon after this. We know that Stevenson Magloire, son of Louisiane saint Florent, had broke with the Saint Soleil in the early 1980s and ended up producing very distinctive work all his own. But he too began with Tiga's artistic rotation at Soissons in 1973, at age 10 with his mother and siblings. His early work also bears the strong influence of his mother. We do not know if Louisiane's daughter, Magda Magloire, also began producing art in Soissons in the beginning, although she must have been living there. We know she seriously took up painting when she returned to Haiti in 1989. Although displaced in time, her early work also resembles early Sans Soleil productions. Some of you probably know that the birth name of the Nouveau Soleil multimedia artist calling himself Onel is Lionel Paul. But not many are familiar with his early acrylic paintings or know that he signed those works Lionel Paul Cineas, the family name of Lavoie Exil's wife, Lucienne. 
And this is why we need accurate historical guides to be able to make these connections. Uh, if, uh, the, if it's not already available to you, we'll be sure to make it available to you on the website, uh, a handout I prepared in which I list the names and a few facts of all the sans soleil artists I could recover without visiting Haiti. Rest assured, it is quite incomplete. Why is it important to situate artworks in time and space? Collectors want to appreciate the art they collect by coming into a deeper or fuller understanding of it. Assured art criticism must rest upon accurate and comprehensive art history. Otherwise, art crit criticism becomes limited by its incomplete foundation. Yet this comprehensive history is what we lack for the Sans Soleil School. And this lack directs the criticism away from specific conditions in which the art is produced and makes it harder to make connections that allow us to situate a movement like Sans Soleil within the complete history of indigenous Haitian art. Thank you. Hey, Haitian art lovers, this is Matt Dunn. Sorry, I was on mute. I'm gonna conduct a short question and answer session uh, with Mark Taylor and Gerald Alexis. And uh, we'll begin and uh, show a short video uh, uh, from Andre Malraux. Oh, hey, here's Gerald and Mark. Thank you so much, we really appreciate your talk. We're going to take some questions from the audience. Yes. Okay. Let's see what we have. Oh, <laughs> can't hear me. All right. So first question is to Gerald. Gerald, uh, I noticed that uh, Hector Hippoli, his technique uh, changed. He had a, sh a short career, we know, but his technique improved quite a bit, and he didn't have the formal training. Uh, what do you attribute that to? Well, one thing that we have to say is that uh, although he went to the Centre d'Art very often, he was not taught how to paint. Uh, actually, uh, Hippolyte was a painter long before the Centre d'Art opened. It is believed uh, because he said that, you know, we can't always uh, put a label of truth on what Hippolyte says that during the uh, marine occupation of Haiti uh, until the 1930s, he used to paint postcards to sell to the Marines. So it means that he was still working. And as the story says, uh, he was discovered after uh, the scout, talent scouts from the South Korea saw his work on the door of a, of a boutique uh, cafe uh, in the suburbs of Saint-Marc. So he was not taught, so he was really self-taught. And the fact is that uh, Hector Hippolyte was observing everything that he sees around him and trying to reproduce it at best. Uh, he, uh, it was often discussed that he used a ruler when he was doing a house to make sure that it came out perfectly. Uh, he, you can see how he improved in the anatomy of the fig of his figures. He even gave it in the in the LCG that I showed. He gave it even gave it some volume, uh, which is amazing after two years of practice. So it's thanks to his observations and his desire to do well uh, that Hippolyte reached this technical know-how. Oh, wonderful! And a, a follow-up question to that, uh, Gerald. Uh, 
we, we know Hippolyte, uh, you know, he died in uh, 1948, I think. And the Salt Soleil movement was so far uh, after in the 70s. Well, wh what do you see the connection between Hector Hippolyte and uh, Salt Soleil artists? Well, <clears throat> they are all trying to facilitate the the contact with the un, unseen world, the, the world above. Uh, in the case of Hippolyte, the, ref, the forms are uh, referential. They are human forms. They are houses, they are trees, they are landscapes. Uh, in the case of Saint Louis, and as uh, Mark recently said, and Saint Soleil, these forms are abstract. And the organization is different from that of, uh, of Hippolyte. Be using uh, referential forms, his organization has to be realistic, which is not the case with Saint Soleil or Saint Brice. Wonderful. Oh, okay, well, now we have some yeah. audience questions. Yeah, I think uh, it's the same thing. They all want to to express their faith. Uh, I see. In their own way. Can I? Now, uh, here's a question from uh, Marcus Redeker. He wants to know. Uh, he 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 said uh, Hippolyte worked as a sailor. Is it true that he? Visited uh, West Africa. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe, as Marcus uh, said in his uh, chat, maybe it was a more spiritual journey. Oh, surely. It's like his love affair with uh, um, uh, Jackinson, with Mrs. Jackinson. Um, she it was in his dream, probably. But he believed very much in the dreams. He could not make the difference between dream and reality. I see. I see. Fact, you know, he would impress people. Um, he, he was a character. Uh, if one day we have the time, I can tell you anecdotes about Italy. They are it's un unbelievable. But you remember, uh, if you read the story of uh, beginning of the Centre d'Art, that when he came, when uh, Peter came with his staff to talk to uh, Hippolyte, he said, I was waiting for you because Ezeli told me that you were coming. Wow. Oh, wow. Amazing. That's it amazing. amazing. I, I, I love his uh, nautical, he has some nautical themed uh, paintings that are fantastic that we have on the website. Yeah. Uh, we have another question from uh, Meg Gilroy. Yes. Uh, she wants Hello, to know Meg. if Hippolyte learned his style uh, from the uh, unknown or unnamed artist who painted uh, peristyles? Many of them uh, got their style from uh, lit uh, chromolithographs of Catholic saints, Catholic images that were done in Mexico or in South America and distributed widely in Haiti. And because they used uh, house paint uh, at the beginning, uh, they, they, they were very comfortable with the strong colors of these chromolithographs. And so uh, they learned how to do people, how to do, um, how to do faces or members, arms and legs and so on. But in case of Hippolyte, it goes further because he was also getting his, uh, his ideas from decals on dishes. You know, it was very common in the 30s and 40s to have dishes with flowers and so on on the Mali on the side and on the center. So very often he would use these motifs and that's probably what he did on the doors of the Le Renaissance Cafe uh, outside of, of, of Saint-Marc. Wonderful, wonderful. We have another question from uh, LaGrace Benson. Uh, she, 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 she says that, uh, uh, the American uh, sculptor uh, Jason Steely, who, who actually did the death mask of, of Hippolyte, yes. uh, Jason said that Hippolyte told him that uh, he visited Africa, but it was he thought it was a dream. Yeah, I'm sure he went. He went to New York. He said he went to New York. Uh, we don't even know if he knew that New York existed, but. He probably heard about it and he said that he went to New York. Uh, he said he went to Cuba uh, and supposedly he met um, Mrs. Jackinson in Cuba and they went to Africa afterward. But no one 
was ever able to find the island of Karajin anywhere in Africa or anywhere else. They're very okay. interesting. Okay, now we have we, uh, Mark. We're not gonna. We're gonna have a question for you. Uh, we have one from Petrushka. Uh, she says, uh, as you noted, uh, Tiga uh, never instructed what to paint, but did the La Rotation uh, artist the La Rotation have any parameters to speak of? Not in terms of subject matter, no, that I am aware of. Uh, it's more of a holistic approach that develops the whole person. Uh, it's, it's the production of an artist more than it is the production of art, if that makes sense. So in terms of subject matter, no. <clears throat> but they did watch him paint, and what he painted is quite often these expressionist uh, faces and bodies. And if they had nothing else to, to go by, they might try to, to do that. Yeah. Can I add something uh, which I found recently, and I published that in one of my books. There, It was a comparison between a work by Levoix Exil and an incised drawing of a Taino goddess. And it's amazing how that I, I don't have the picture with me, uh, but I showed it to Mark. And the resemblance is amazing. But what you can find also wow. in, this, in this work of Saint Soleil, and that has to be investigated, the influence of the uh, pre Columbian uh, art, is that you have a lot of motifs that are found in ceramic vases that you find in the works of Saint, Saint Soleil, the crisscrosses and so on. Yeah, that's, that's quite true. Uh, I believe that uh, Lavoie Exil said that he's actually. Uh, at least in his imagination, more influenced by the uh, Taino heritage than the African heritage. Mm -hmm. Again, you have to take these statements uh, kind of with a grain of salt or, or get them contextualized. Uh, also, one thing is that uh, a lot of these artists, um, uh, they're very interested in myths of Atlantis, uh, spaceships from uh, uh, Sirius, Zephyram recently did a whole series of UFO paintings. Amazing. Really yeah. great. Uh, so um, there's really no telling where these influences come from, uh, mm -hmm. literally from outer space. I just want to add something. Uh, <clears throat> you probably would wonder how he would have, how artists like that would have access to ceramic pottery from the pre Columbian era. They are all available in voodoo temples. Very, very commonly, you'll find uh, fragments of ceramics in these voodoo temples and, uh, and the stones as well, the hatchets and so on. And they're used as ritual objects. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, Mark, we have a question about uh, someone is asking uh, about uh, Lavoy uh, XL. Now he, now, he was part of the, the Sank uh, Stelay, right? Sure. Yeah, he was. So, um, this, the question is, uh, why, why wasn't he included with the early Saint Soleil group? Oh, he uh, he was not there at the very beginning. I think he was still working as a mason, uh, building the house. Uh, he began painting in 1972, uh, but he wasn't really doing much with it or, or trying to integrate himself until 1973. And he did uh, become part of uh, Tiga's artistic rotation. Interesting. That's the only reason. Very interesting. Another question from Marcus Redeker. Uh, he wants to know, uh, just to talk about uh, um, how uh, Sambris uh, uh, signed his paintings. He, he had heard a story from, uh, from Bill Bolendorf in Pittsburgh and just wanted to see if you had any in, intel about that. Uh, the answer is he signed them in many different ways and sometimes other people signed them. He was illiterate. Yeah. Um, I think early on his wife would sign his paintings uh, for them. So if you have a Sombris painting with a legible signature, he didn't sign it. Yeah. Um, oh. Well, uh, at, at, with, with time, Robert uh, was more legible than the rest. 
Well, yeah, usually when he signed them himself, he could get the ROB and then the rest just kind of descended into curly cues and, and dots. Uh, also, the dealer, Isa, uh, would sometimes sign his paintings. And apparently, he was the one who was trying to teach uh, Sombris to sign his name so he wouldn't have to keep doing it. I suspect that those signed by his wife or Isa are probably earlier paintings. As you know, Hippolyte never signed his work either. Uh, at one point, he just put his initials, but most of the time, the works by Hippolyte were signed by the repeaters. Uh, let's see what else we have here. Any more questions? Oh, uh, Mark, uh, can you talk a little bit more about uh, what we all know um, about the uh, Capetian uh, family, uh, Philomeo Ban and his brother and his nephews and grandsons? So is there similar uh, familial co connections in the Sausalé artists and world? Goodness, yes. Uh, the, uh, the number of artists from the Smith family, uh, I can't even tell you how many of them there are. I'm still discovering ones I've never uh, heard of before. Uh, so uh, Denis Smith is the best known. He's one of the Sans Soleil, but there are many, many others, some of which were there from the beginning. Uh, the, um, uh, their children also. Uh, 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 Le Bois Exil has at least a son and a daughter who have become artists. Um, Antiome Richard, his son, uh, Richard Nesley, uh, became an artist. Yeah, so the family uh, connections uh, uh, are, are very, um, very close, very convoluted. I could not even sort out uh, the relation. <laughs> it's only recently I made the connection between Lionel Paul, who is uh, a younger brother of Ducel Paul, uh, and his connection with Lavoie Exil's wife and that family. And I'm sure there are many more connections to be discovered. Yeah. Uh, no, well, here's a question for uh, both uh, uh, Gerald and Mark. Now, we, we have these two French guys. We have uh, André Breton in the 40s, who was a big fan of uh, Hector Hippolyte. And then we have this uh, André Malraux, who... Uh, uh, came to Haiti in, in the, was it 75 and talked mm -hmm. about the Sausalé group. Now, <clears throat> how big an influence w w was having these two, two guys talk about Haiti and Haitian artists? Well, let's go chronologically and I'll let Gerald talk about uh, Breton. Well, I would say that they're very important because it brought the attention of the world on a series of works of art that the Haitian public was not ready for. Because you have to understand that uh, not only the quality, the formal quality of the work of Hippolyte was not acceptable to the Haitian buying public, but also the fact that it dealt essentially with Voodoo, which was another, another no-no. And so by, by uh, implying that uh, Hippolyte would probably have a contribution to make to the surrealist movement, which was a big thing. Uh, the Haitians thought he was exaggerating and so on. But as time went by, it was a good reference. When the Haitian public became aware of the quality and the work of equity, you know, by discussions, by exhibitions, by publications, which lack in the case of uh, Saint Soleil, as Mark said, they realized that uh, Breton was not fooling around. Uh, and, and for, for Malraux, it's the same thing. I mean, uh, it was totally unexpected uh, to find what he, they was done in Saint Soleil. Because by the time Breton came, this first movement of Hippolyte and so on didn't exist anymore. You could find works in private collections, mostly abroad, uh, but in, in galleries in Haiti and Everywhere you could you could not see anything of that sort. So his his amazement to see the Saint Soleil 
uh, people and the way they live uh, was astonishing for him, I guess. Don't you think, Matt? Uh, oh, absolutely. Um, I think that Malraux's uh, visit and his influence, though, uh, is kind of a two-edged sword. Uh, I'm actually trying to not talk about Malraux and his influence when I talk about Sans Soleil, <laughs> because uh, I do think that maybe distorted is not the right word, but we there is this overarching uh, emphasis on seeing Sans Soleil as Malraux understood it, not as he wrote about it. And I think it might be a little more useful if we put a little more emphasis on talking about Sans Soleil it's from right. an indigenous point of view. Yeah. Now, um, I think that Sans Soleil probably would have gone international even without Malraux's influence, but because of his influence, when they went uh, international, when they visited France, it was explosive. And uh, the other way in which I think uh, Malraux's influence was a double-edged sword is that it probably precipitated the breakup of the Sans Soleil uh, community in 1978, 1979. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean that everybody got a big head and started fighting with each other. It wasn't like that at all but rather that Tiga's economic model, which made sense in a peasant commune, just was not workable uh, in an international setting where suddenly these paintings were selling uh, in New York and Paris and uh, Berlin for uh, a, a, a lot of money. Uh, yeah. and, and so I think that, that that was problematic too. Now, as far as I know, the artists did stay on good terms with each other, and they stayed on good terms with Tiga. Yeah, it's well. like, we're just not going to work with you anymore. We can do this on our own. And eventually, five of them formed uh, uh, their own uh, uh, atelier, uh, they, uh, their own incorporation, the Saint Soleil. Tiga was kind of disappointed of having lost control um, because Tiga is a leader. Uh, so he thought that uh, he would have control over the development of the Saint Soleil experience. I, and yeah, he I know. He I, lost control. Yeah, and I, there's varying opinions about Tiga. Uh, Selden Rodman, I, I think, uh, was very suspicious of him. Well, Tiga was also suspicious of Rodman. So, <laughs> yes. uh, I, 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 yeah. Uh, um, but, I don't know, from what I've been able to study, never having met the guy, uh, my impression of him is fairly positive. But sure, he was a leader. That's what he did. And uh, losing some of that must have been a little hard to swallow. Well, it was not his first experience because he had created an atelier uh, in Port-au-Prince and working essentially with young artists starting uh, because he felt at one point that the Haitian art, quote unquote, modern, was going too international. So he wanted to create a more Haitian school, a new school of Haitian art. And out of that came an artist like Philippe Dodar, uh, for instance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 One, one follow up of, about Malraux, uh, Mark. You know, you know Malraux was, was uh, he worked on a couple of projects with uh, Jean Marie Drop, right? Mm hmm. Yeah. And, I, and I think I saw in one of his books, I mean, so he was very, very from, he must have been very familiar with Haitian art in general. Uh, that I cannot speak to. Uh, Gerald, okay. perhaps you can. Jamal yeah. Hidro was hired uh, to be the filmographer of, uh, of Malo. He followed him everywhere. And uh, they put out uh, four CDs uh covering the various trips of uh, Malraux and his discoveries and so on because Malraux was proning the idea of a, a world museum you, you know where art was everywhere and so on everybody was a creator and so on so uh, Jean-Marie filmed him a lot and compiled this into this four four uh, cd uh dvds um Quite interesting, as a matter of fact. Absolutely, yeah. And uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, Larry Kent was talking about the uh, the Drill Museum. There's a. It's somewhere in France where 
he has a, a, a really quite a nice collection of all kinds of art, including including Haitian art. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, well, he was he was even more a fanatic of Saint Louis because you you all know, I suppose, the uh, the painter Rouault, uh, who was a mystic uh, painter, and in in Malraux's house there was a Saint Louis next to it, and he used to say. That it would take a lot of energy for Raoul to compare to to compete with Fabrice, which means that he put Fabrice ahead of a French master of the modernist movement. That's a big thing. Very interesting. Let me see if we have any more questions. Oh, well, well, you have a question about uh, some of the art. This is uh, not. Gerard, it's of course uh, La Fortune Felix. Yes. <laughs> La Fortune Felix is more on the line of Hector Hippolyte. Actually, he is like the, the second generation of Hippolyte. Yeah, I, I, I personally, I, I think La Fortune Felix is has to be the most underrated Haitian artist. That's true. That's true. Uh, but well, we have one more question from uh, Marcus Redeker. Yes. Oh, here, this is a, a wonderful question uh, to, to the, the group. Uh, he wants to know uh, if you see any relationship between the uh, Haitian art and the magical realism of the Caribbean and Latin American uh, uh, writers and artists. Yes. Um. The, the, the Cuban critic, uh, Jose Gomez Sicre, who was a director of the OAS Museum in Washington, which is now the uh, uh, American Museum of Art or something like that. Uh, when he came to the Centre d'Art uh, in the uh, shortly after his opening, uh, I guess it's a known fact that uh, Peters was not impressed by the so-called primitives. And uh, Gomez Sicre was responsible uh, for drawing attention of Peters on these artists because they had done an experiment in Cuba in the 30s, which was called La Escuela Nueve, and where they handed out a painting and brushes to peasants. And they created works very much like what was done in the first year of the Santo So it existed also. The, the, the second thing is that when Breton came to Port-au-Prince, he was he associated what he saw with the, the ex-votos that he found in Mexico while he was there, uh, staying with Diego Rivera. So there are uh, there are uh, relations like that. You also find not formally, but spiritually, you also find uh, the art of Dudley in Jamaica. Uh, with that of, uh, of Haitian artists. And I always wanted to do an exhibition of Dudley and Hippolyte together. Oh, wow. That would be fantastic. Yeah. So there is, there is something regional. As far as San Soleil goes, uh, I don't know if I necessarily see the connection with the magical realism of South America. Uh, but one thing that does strike me is the similarity uh, in style uh, and even in subject, so to speak, with uh, outsider, so-called outsider artists of other cultures, particularly those uh, of a, a spiritual or visionary sort of nature. Uh, stylistically, things like the stippling, the, the multitude of little dots, uh, and the uh, dense patterning, uh, and the preoccupation with faces, which are humanoid but not human. Uh, I see this across the world uh, in uh, outsider art of that nature. Uh, I don't know how well this has been explored, but that interests me very much. Well, wow, we have a comment from uh, LaGrace Benson. Uh, and she, she points out that uh, Alejo uh, Carpentier coined yeah. the term magical yeah. realism. He spoke of his time in Haiti as the genesis of the magical realism movement. 
Yeah, because the kingdom of the world. world. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, according to according to Carpentier, there is something fantastic about Haiti's history, uh, not its art necessarily, about the whole thing, about how people live, uh, their beliefs, uh, their art, of course, uh, their history. I mean, you know, he was impressed by the, the citadel of Christophe, which is absolutely unbelievable uh, that a former slave would have built such a thing. I mean, it's just extraordinary. So that's why he, he developed this marvelous uh, um, uh, realism, oh, I, I think, uh, the grace, uh, I, I had something not quite right, <laughs> but anyway, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a good point. Do we have yeah. any more questions from the our virtual audience. Last call for questions. Anybody? Well, <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, Grace said she just uh, can't type. She can, take right. well, she can take her time. Yeah. All right. Well, let's say what well, well, we can, we can, uh, we can wrap it up. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Gerald Alexis and Mark Taylor for their time and their, and this amazing presentation. I think uh, everyone has learned uh, quite a bit. I know I did. Uh, we'd also like to thank, um, Everyone who put on put on the uh, this live stream, uh, uh, everyone from Magdala, uh, Rustin Silva, and the crew at DMS International, Rebecca and Augustine, uh, we're, we're not quite done yet. Uh, we're going to um, we're going to see a short video about Malro, and and then I'm going to give a tour of the website. Uh, We'll see some Hippolytes, we'll see some Saint Soleil, we'll see some flags. And, uh, you know, we'll talk about Malraux's theory of uh, imaginary museum, um, Musée Imaginaire. We're, we're Okay, well, uh, Mal Malro was, uh, I'm going to show the website, but Malro was talking about the uh, ideal collection of art where you can take art from all over the globe, uh, different uh, cultures, different pieces. If, if you had the, uh, he said art books were uh, opening up the possibilities to display art. Okay, now, and let's, uh, let's go to the website. Uh, all right, here we go. Let's uh, make this bigger. Uh, as you see here, this is our, our uh, welcome page, and we have a menu across the top. You can see we have some uh, Hippolyte paintings just on the main page. But what's great about this site is we can come and uh, go to uh, an artist directory and just type in uh, a couple letters and click on Hippolyte and you can get a, a biography, a sh very short biography of Hippolyte. And then we have more Hippolytes than any museum uh, shown on our site. And I'm going to just go down here. Here's the self-portrait of Hippolyte. Uh, here's, here's some 
nautical ones. This one was uh, illustrated in Island on Fire, plate two. And then from here, another cool thing is you can see it's Hector Hippolyte. Uh, there's a little Sancho Dart tag, but there's also a tag. This is part of the collection Island on Fire. And if I click on that, it'll uh, send me over to this uh, new page here. And th these are paintings that are illustrated in the seminal book, Island on Fire. And you can just see some uh, amazing pictures. Here's one, uh, Revenge. One of my favorites from Rigo Benoit. Just absolutely amazing. Another uh, cool thing we have, uh, we go to collections. We have collections, both public and private. For uh, public collections, we can just click here and see what MoMA has. We can see what's in the Selden Rodman Gallery or the Milwaukee Art Museum. And that'll uh, take us over there and you can see all the amazing pieces in the Milwaukee Art Museum collection. We can go back. Uh, here's a new feature, curated collections. Now this is something that Mal Rowe would certainly be excited about. So what this is, is uh, just a collection of important pieces of uh, Haitian art from all different places. This one, Murder in the Jungle, is of co course uh, in the MoMA collection. And as we go through here, these are just uh, different pieces from different sources. Uh, here's uh, Castera Basil from the 50s, uh, an amazing uh, Prefet Dufault, Spider Queen, just what an amazing piece that is. Here's, uh, of course, the Milwaukee uh, Recall of the Dead. And on any of these pieces, uh, here's uh, the Lomeo Band, the, the absolutely famous uh, Lakakos uh, on the Hippolyte Bridge there. See there in red. And if you click through this, it'll take you right to the painting. And you can see this was part of the flag collection. Just uh, wonderful. Uh, so you can kind of click around and see all kinds of cool stuff. You know, you can uh, either search under artist. Uh, if you want to see flags, you can type in a, a name. And of course, we're, we're building this every day. Here's uh, Constant, some beautiful Constant flags. This one's from 2019. It's called uh, Exorcism. Fantastic. Another cool thing is if you go to our resources, we have all kinds of great resources, uh, even videos. If you want to see a video of the director's tour of the Kafau or Kafu <laughs> exhibit. They're almost like kind of codes to... Here it is, I'm, uh, I'm coming in at the end. running now, throughout so. this exhibition. Here's uh, and the... You know, in many ways. I'll mute this guy. Uh, I'll talk over him. He's, he's talking about uh, many of these paintings that were uh, shown in uh, the Nottingham uh, Gallery. Uh, Cafu, Art, and Voodoo. And then, so it's, it's really informative. So you can see videos. Uh, another super cool thing is you can come down to, uh, we just have a bunch of links here. This one's interesting. September 1st, 1947. This was uh, a lot of Americans, their first introduction to Haitian art. So 73 years ago, there was this article in Life magazine. And there's this amazing Rigaud Benoit painting. And then here's the master, Hector Hippolyte. And uh, so, that, so this is the first thing they saw in 1947. And then the other artists that were Represented September 1st. Uh, here's a uh, Lubrichard Poisson. Here's uh, the painting we just looked at, uh, Philomeo Bain. Here's a very early, cool uh, Wilson Bigot. And then, of course, uh, Hippolyte. So, 
go back to our our, our website. Uh, if you click on the join, you know here's uh, reasons you may want to join. Uh, you can oh I forgot to talk about our our newsletter Veve. Here's uh, you, we we have we're about to come out with a new issue of Veve. Here's uh, if you want to go back to a, a, a previous issue. Some uh, great articles. This one we have a uh, great interview with uh, Randall Morris from the uh, Calvin Morris Gallery in uh, New York, and some wonderful art. Here's my favorite, La Fortune Felix. But you know, feel free to go to the site, and I would I would definitely check out these collections. So you know, we have these. Uh, if you're a member, you can have this wonderful. Uh, Here's uh, Gerald Alexis and um, uh, his collection of wonderful works on paper, primarily. Just, just fantastic. This one is by, of all people, uh, Wilson Bigot. You would not expect to see this from Wilson Bigot. And if you want to see what a typical Wilson Bigot looks like, you would just click on the tag and here's. Uh, this amazing uh, output of Wilson McGo. Of course, you know, his earlier work or uh, like from 1952, I'll show you the, here's a uh, miracle of Kana. This one's in the Figgy Art Museum. Some of these are, are uh, there's the one that was in uh, Life Magazine. Just absolutely fantastic resource. Yeah, we have quite a few. He, you know, here's this. He, he did many different versions of this man in the the rah rah costume. Oh, we also have a blog. So on the blog, you can click on down, and here's uh, just a a. a a short comparison of three different versions of basically the same uh, nativity painting, one from 54, one from 61. So it's really cool to see them side by side. And then uh, you can see kind of stylistically how they've changed. And uh, this one, of course, is in the, the wonderful uh, Beverly and John Fox Sullivan collection. So again, I, I you know I can spend a lot of time on this, uh, and here's a little a little more about uh, what we're trying to do here uh, at the Haitian Art Society. So it, it, the the big thing is you know we're an all volunteer organization. So in general, I think uh, as a group, and, and I personally, I feel that Haitian art is vastly underappreciated and underrepresented in museums. So by promoting Haitian art by any means necessary, we're going to try to get the attention of curators and academics and collectors, everyone, to spread the word about Haitian art because it's absolutely amazing. So uh, with that, uh, I guess we can uh, say our goodbyes. I, again, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Gerald Alexis and Mark Taylor for that presentation, uh, for their time and their effort for putting that together. Uh, also, uh, Magdala uh, uh, Restine Silva, who spearheaded the project with uh, DMS International to uh, get this live stream together, uh, and her team, uh, Rebecca and Augustine, and uh, Ed Gessen, who uh, spearheaded uh the board of directors and everything we do here at the haitian art society again we're all volunteers but we're just uh uh absolute uh crazy about haitian art passionate and uh we want to spread the word and make a difference so uh, uh if you'd like to support us go to the website and uh volunteer for something and we're always uh i'm adding new new uh 
artwork to the website every day. And we have a lot of exciting uh, things coming up in the year 2022, a couple months away. So uh, we look forward to uh, seeing your participation.